Um, good morning and thank you for having me here. Um, so Down is on a bit of a journey over the past few years looking about how we improve our business. Um, as you probably um, know that we work for a lot of you, um, is that um, we're an enterprise that operates across Australia and New Zealand and in the New Zealand transport space alone about 3,500 staff. We look after about 30,000 k's of road on your behalf. Um, so as far as, um, um, as far as business process um, improvement goes, um, in our industry, and in particularly in asset management, is um, around the concept of treating knowledge as an asset. We are a data-rich um, sector. And in fact, if, um, the way that I look at um, engineering is the application of science and technology to the physical world. Um, asset management is the application of information technology to the physical world. And we're a data-rich um, um, sector as, as a result of that. Now, it could also be argued that we're also an information-poor um, 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 sector as well. We don't communicate that well to decision makers, to politicians and to senior executives, in the case of me, um, about how we translate the, the, the data and knowledge that we have into how they change their decision making. As far as our networks go, um, we have a lot of data as everyone knows. We turn some of it into information, either through analysis or using GIS or whatever. But then the, 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 the real value of it is when we turn it into knowledge and wisdom, when we actually make a difference with that data or um, to how we manage the network as far as the assets con um, concerned, or from my perspective, and I guess it impacts on you as well, um, how operationally effective we are at managing that asset. Intelligent systems can help us through that first component. All right? This is just my personal view. But beyond that, you really need people, the people in this room. You need grey matter. So the smartest systems in the world will only get you halfway through that information level. You need people. Now, the, the, the next thing is we have to, have to systematically think about managing knowledge as an asset. We don't do it. We have some very good people to come into our organisations. They set up some good systems, some, some good processes. They then move on. And quite often, we lose that knowledge. Um, so if we apply the same Deming cycle, to knowledge, what would that look like? So plan, do, check, we're all used to that. That's effectively what we do as asset managers all the time with the data and from the asset perspective. But what about what's in your heads? What about you feeding back to the, to the, to the, to the foundation of why we even collect this data? So this is the model that we operate within the business that I um, work for. Business processes are our foundation. We operate two levels, well, in fact, lots of levels, but our first one, that PMO, is our project management office, so it's some guiding um, project management principles, but then our core processes, which in this case is around asset management. We then look at the enterprise data model component, so standardisation of data. Um, George's presentation um, just prior to morning tea was perfect for mine, because uh, um, standardisation of data and, and terminology is critical. We then have these core systems, um, in, the, in, 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 in the asset management space, a suite of systems. Um, they then have supporting systems. And then you do some sort of presentation. You may use um, business intelligence tools or you just use Excel, either or. And you then have some way that you disseminate that. The idea then is that senior leaders or, or even people that work for your organisation could reach through these systems and, and without having to know all this information behind all the detail, they can get the quality information that they need to make better decisions. However, as, a, as an industry, we traditionally focus on this bit here. How often, for the organisations that we've worked for, that, um, have we heard things like, oh, we have a system and we need to replace it. We've, 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 we're up to our third asset management system because they're all rubbish. Well, that's not the truth. The, the truth is probably is that it's, it's the underlying component that hasn't been sorted out. They haven't got standardised business um, processes. They don't have a business improvement model around that. They don't have enterprise data uh, model. They don't even think like that. I mean, a couple of years ago, we talked in, um, at, at, at the RIMS Forum in, in 2011 around having a, um, a standardised um, um, data structure for the asset information. We have to move towards some of that type of thing. So it's built on that. That's the foundation aspect. If you have this, and you have this at the top, so therefore you can communicate effectively with your stakeholders and customers, this bit in the middle can all change. It can, be pl can become plug and play. Because this is where your real IP sits in, what you do and how you describe it. Um, so here are some of the, um, the, the, the key goals that we looked at. Standardising the commercial framework, um, 
So a lot of things around standardisation, consistency of data and reporting. Um, one of the key things around um, standardising, and George talked about earlier on, is terminology. Um, you, the time you spend in sorting out that terminology and getting standardised, um, so it makes sense, have good descriptions around it, um, is invaluable. It'll be that source information that you'll go back to and you'll, be, it's really your legacy. It'll be the legacy from the knowledge that you have will be fed back into those business processes and, and, those, and those enterprise data models. The technology will continue to evolve in 10, 15 years' time. Those core processes and, and enterprise data model descriptions will be there for many years beyond the software. So as far as business process uh, maps go and, and models go, um, it's, it's quite simple. It's, it's just a cascade. It's very natural for asset managers to, to think about business improvement and business improvement modelling. It, it's not a big step for us because we're used to technology. We're used to thinking in very structured, logical ways. Um, however, I do recommend that if you go down this pathway, that you engage specialist BAs to do the documentation. Because one thing that I've found with the engineers and asset managers is that we assume a lot of knowledge. We're not that good at documenting. We, we, we miss steps because we just think everyone knows that. But that's not the case. A business analyst will ask those questions, they'll come, keep on pulling you back, and, the, and they can do something that a skill that we don't have, and that's document. So I'm going to take you through an example. Um, and I've chosen um, um, routine maintenance. Um, the reason why I've chosen routine maintenance is there's some aspects around it that I can actually control. Um, you probably can't see all of that, but that's a, a landscape business process. So it's a very, very high level one, all right? Um, so it talks about the customer, it talks about the client customer management teams, um, the, the client asset management team, so the vast majority of this room, um, and, and the primary supplier um, type people that do the physical work, us. And you see a whole lot of different functions um, and, and activities occurring. The key thing I want to show you here in this are these grey um, th boxes. Those grey boxes represent where we're doing KPIs. So by doing that, we're actually pinning the process a supervisor, who a blue-collar supervisor, looked at this and he says, well, and he picked up very quickly. For him to actually be successful across all of these things, these five key performance indicators will control that, which is what the, the purpose is. And, and in fact, we didn't need 200 of them. We didn't need 100 KPIs. We only needed five for this particular overall maintenance. In fact, my understanding with working with um, specialists in, in, in performance management, is that the best um, companies in the world have no more than 25 KPIs to describe their entire organisation. So, I'm going to talk about this one here, and I'll take you into a little bit of detail about maintaining a three-monthly programme. So what we did is then we went through and, and articulated. So what we're doing is we're capturing that wisdom and knowledge from subject matter experts within the organisation and then, and then um, um, documenting them. Now, um, for those that haven't seen these types of flowcharts before, they're called swim lane flowcharts. Up the side there, there's a very nice word for those, um, those each swim lane, they're called actors. And as you saw in George's one earlier on, he had tools down the bottom, it's also called systems, and so therefore you can see a relation between the different roles that people play, as well as what they actually do and what systems they touch on. Um, just for some um, glossary, for some terminology, JMS is job management systems, FWP's Forward Works Program, PRS is Productivity Reporting System. Um, so we, we can go through and step through and you can see um, who's involved with doing various functions. And then it slides onto the... So this is just one component. Each of those, um, in that landscape map I showed you early on, for each of those boxes or triangles or parallelograms you saw, there could be one to five of these processes um, documented. So this is four pages long, just for one component. In fact, for doing that three-monthly program, there are actually three processes that helped explain this, and I'm just showing you one of them. So it goes into a lot of detail, and, it, and then we go through and explain what, what's behind this. And if you look very carefully, you'll see that the date suddenly changed. And the reason why is these are live and active, and what actually happened was during the review process, we then improved it. So it's part of that continual improvement. We tried it out, we said, oh, actually, there's room for improvement, we improved it, we documented it, and go through a proper, proper quality control system around that. And it just continues on. So, I mean, it, it, as I said, I mean, th there's, there's a number of things like decision making and so forth, but the main point I wanted to show was that it, it's clearly communicated. Um, 
what were some of the, um, the, the, the real benefits that we found through that process? Well, first of all, we were able to standardise roles. Um, we found in our organisation that we had lots of people that had similar titles but did totally different things. Um, and it was a real struggle for us to nail that down. It comes back to terminology, but even more so about what people actually did. So we were able to start thinking about developing really robust job management system, um, job descriptions, um, which then leads on the whole HR and change management process. As an organisation, we're really just dipping our toes into this. This is a really a long-term process for us, which we run out over the next three, three to four years. It took us two years to get to this point. Huge amount of effort. Um, it also is impacting on our organisational structure because we now know what people do and know the relationships between what functions they do. Um, so it, it is quite a, a, an organisational redesign. It needs senior leadership sponsorship to make it happen. So coming back to this, um, I spoke about that. Well, what about the enterprise data model? I thought I'd just take you through uh, something quite quickly around that space. This is, I've decided to do the financial and the commercial side and not do the asset management side because um, I'll show you something that's maybe a little bit different from what you guys are involved with. We decided as an organisation to go through and standardise all the activities that we do on the work, so uh, on a job. So these are all the financial components. These here include things like that goes into our cost recording system, so we standardise that, standardise and rework right across the business, something we hadn't done earlier or previously. And, and the reality is, we were dealing with your databases, when we want to mine them to understand what's actually happening within the networks. We've got to go into 60 different databases and then try and translate them all so how you guys have described curb and channel or footpaths or bluestone curb and channel. There, there are, every, every local authority seems to do it slightly differently. So we then have to translate that into a standardised code so that we can an, an, analyse it. But in, in terms of the commercial stuff, we can control that, and that's why I'm showing you this example. So we then went through and, and, and came up with very clear naming conventions. And there are whole documents around this to support this, because really that IP people can go back to and see what assumptions we made, what decisions we made in next year, in five years' time, in 10 years' time. And they can understand some of the limitations that we had at the time. Um, yeah. For us, for an example, um, in 2010, 2011, um, we had $56 million assigned to one GL code um, called Other, Other Materials. Um, so when um, the Executive General Manager um, for Transport asked me how much money did we spend on cement, um, it's somewhere in there. So we've now got a much more... Um, so what impact does this have on you guys? Well, you think, well, well we're a contractor, it, it just means that that's our problem to solve. Well, yes it is, and yes we have. Um, but what it does mean is that now we know clearly all our different um, costs and where they uh, um, uh, are being coming from, so therefore we've developed different types of supplier contracts. The result from that is you get the vast majority of those savings. In fact, any business improvement um, that a, a, a primary supplier does for an organisation, we've realised over 75% of those savings, we don't, they, they never hit our bottom line. They, they end up going back in lower rates or lower costs the client always gets the vast majority of those savings. So, but it does help us understand what's going on in our business a bit better. Um, not that you need to know the detail about this, but we've then captured the intelligence for to make sure that when people put data into systems or processes, that it's smart data. We're using smart tools to do it. So therefore, it, it's transferring that knowledge and wisdom from this, our subject matter experts to ensure that you can't put silly data into into those, those core systems, but that's based on your business processes and your, and your enterprise data model. It, it's not looking at saying, look, I'm, I've got data, I've got this database I've got to fill. Is, are, 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 are they all, f um, is it fully, um, what's the right term? Is it fully uh, um, occupied? Have you gone through with all the, all the right field types and, and oh, the, the word's complete? Is the, is the asset register complete? Um, we've gone through and said, well, why is that field even needed to be completed to begin with? And you'll see it documented. It won't be just one line. It will say, this is what the value is, and this is how it links to this business process. So you can see that direct relationship between the data we're collecting and, and the value that we want to generate for, for, for the business. I won't go through that. So um, how do we use some of this stuff? Well, right at the dissemination layer, I'm going to show you an example very quickly. Of, of how we've used business processes to, to look at our business and operate um, more effectively. 
Here's a type of activity that we do on all your roads. I'm not going to be prescriptive about what it is. Um, if you have a look at it, that green triangle, that is um, the current scenario, and I've called that a reactive crew. And what we've looked at is applying the asset management principles about understanding what the network condition is. We've, looked, we've gone through now and, and pulled out of all your databases a standardised way of, of understanding the networks. We've looked, pulled out of all the job management systems a standardised way of looking at all the physical work that's been done over the previous few years and what's yet to be done. We then looked at what types of actual quantity of, of, of network need there is across the country. Not your individual contract, but the country. We then looked at it and applied um, GIS layers and looked at clusters. So we looked at a whole lot of different tools. So basically, looking at this, we looked at our business processes, we stepped right through here. We pulled stuff from our business processes, our standardised enterprise data model, we pulled things from the asset register, your con the condition assessment that's been done on your network, either by us or by others. Um, we did needs analysis, we pulled through the spatial stuff, we pulled through stuff from our financial management system, we then presented it as a nice pretty graph. And this pretty graph actually shows well, if we've got so much volume of work, we pulled then pulled together some subject matter experts and said, what would you do differently? And we started with a blank piece of a blank wall, and we said, now knowing this, what sort of decisions would you make? And they came up with different types of different ways of doing that work activity. And this is based on daily production rates, being a contractor. And as you can tell, as a client, you'd be saying to yourself, Ooh, I'd like to have that blue line, thank you. Um, because you see, that's for per We're talking about we do hundreds and hundreds of thousands of square metres of this type of maintenance work. And, um, and you can see there that if we were able to, to um, achieve this type of productivity rate with this type of crew, which is totally different than what we've historically done, the cost base becomes less than $20 a square metre. Compared to the cost base, this is the cost, this isn't profit or overheads on top of which, it's not the sell rate, which, which is what you guys get, it's the cost rate. It's a phenomenal difference. So much so that on this one activity alone, this would represent around a six to eight million dollars per year um, just for the work that Downer does. All right, so it's quite a different way of thinking, of which typically you'd get 75% of that anyway in lower rates as we go through the tendering process. Um, because our commercial team are really keen to win contracts, which is great, it pays my mortgage. Um, but then um, it's, it, 25% of that, we then use, well, less than 25%, we usually can then say, well, that's, that business improvement has resulted in, in profit. So what does that mean? Well, it means the decision makers can say, we want to do more of this. The, the CEO for Downer signed off on these crews, and these crews required millions of dollars in investment, millions for one crew, uh, which is quite different it, um, than what we had historically done. When this discussion paper or, or um, was done, it was still in a draft, the CEO signed off on the CapEx, which is unheard of in Downer, by the way. Um, we have a very strict CapEx process to go through. It just made sense. It was of such good value to him. It had good value information. There was no one saying, like historically for plant, people would used to say, oh, we want to like to have this new type of stabilisation plant, or this new type of digger, or this new type of sprayer, and this is how much hours of utilisation. Here's the data. This is where it came from. This is the quality around that data. And he just went through and said, that makes sense. Where do I sign? And it was literally like that. It was done that fast. And um, uh, what the, the length of the line represents was where th those circles represent where we did the, um, the CapEx um, um, return on investment levels at. The blue lines, uh, the, the, the length of the lines represented what we felt as, as um, well, that was like the 85th percentile or 90th percent percentile of total maximum productivity we could expect to get in store main quality. So it was like, um, this is what, well, this is what we, 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 we sell to the accountants, but potentially it went up to here. The reality is um, the crew that we first trialled this on is actually achieving around here. So if you look at that, that's more than a 50% cost saving. That's using data and information quite differently. It meant that when we went through and said to our, um, um, our senior management team, in fact, they came to us and said, where further can we invest? We want more asset managers within the business. What sort of systems do you need? What sort of tools do you need to make this better? Because the reality is there are huge opportunities through our, our industry as we move from a craftsman-type culture 
where individuals learn knowledge to actually using modern technology and using best practice and, 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 and business process improvement. And here's the process you sort of go through. Um, this gentleman here, it's not new, and I wanted to show you, I didn't want to go through and recreate the slide, I wanted to show you something that someone had written about over a decade ago, it's not new, about the process you step through. And if you look at this very carefully, you'll see in there, there's plan, there's do, there's analyse, and then you go back again. It's the same process as what Deming talked about 60 years ago. Um, to do this though, you do need senior leadership support to actually drive the change. Thank <laughs> you.